Dr. Jason show it. He's, sorry, got to get my other glasses. Dr. Showit is currently the Chair of Pediatric Hematology Oncology in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center in Wor Worcester, Massachusetts. He received his MD and PhD at Boston University School of Medicine and did his residency and fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine and the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Showit was an associate professor at Baylor College of Medicine and attending physician at Texas Children's Hospital for many years. Dr. Jason, show it. Hi, thank you. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank Pat for putting on this wonderful conference. And um, it's really amazing to see all of these parents here with rapt, paying rapt attention to complex bio biochemical pathways and trying to figure out what's, uh, what's best for their children. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for coming and, and being, uh, spending a little time learning about immunotherapy and uh, uh, the challenges that are going forward. So what I'd like to do today is just review some of the different approaches to immunotherapy and what immunotherapy means in 2019, um, and highlight some of the challenges of targeting solid tumors um, as compared to leukemia and lymphoma and also talk about neuroblastoma biology and immunology, some of the challenges um, and opportunities for treating this with immunotherapy. Then we'll talk a little bit about um, ongoing data and projects in the lab um, that we're doing to develop uh, new immunocompetent tumor models uh, to test uh, immunotherapy in combination with other, other therapeutics. Um, so thank you very much. And I wanna just start with a, a broad question what is immunotherapy? I asked several of the residents in the hospital last week, can you describe immunotherapy in one sentence? And all of them failed. Um, and then I asked the medical students and they, I gave them two sentences and they couldn't do it either. So, so basically it's a, it's a way, it's a new approach to target the immune system towards the cancer. And there are a lot of things that have to be overcome. Um, there are different ways of doing it. One is reactivating suppressed um, sort of automatic immune responses. And this is, uh, can be classified as sort of releasing the brakes or, or, or turning on an immune system that is already ready to go but just has to be uh, let loose, okay? And this is what the checkpoint inhibitors do, the antibodies, um, they basically disinhibit checkpoints. So that's one way of doing it. The other approach is to generate new responses to cancer cells. So a tumor develops uh, in a child and the fact that it has grown and spread means that it, is, uh, it by definition means that the immune system is not killing it. Um, and it has learned to evade the immune system and uh, now some very clever molecular engineers have learned how to gener generate synthetic immune responses uh, Dr. Hexie this morning talked about the um, NKT cell uh, therapeutics. That's with a, a chimeric antigen receptor, uh, which is a novel molecule, doesn't exist in nature. So it's a synthetic uh, approach. And here, um, this is a way of developing new targets, attacking new targets that are specific for the cancer. Um, so a little bit of detail. So releasing the brakes, hitting the gas. So immune checkpoints, what do they do? They're, they, if you think about it, any kind of immune reaction, whether it's to an infection or to cancer, needs to be controlled because you can initiate an immune response and you're, you're releasing all kinds of cytokines, all kinds of inflammatory markers. As soon as the body initiates that, it starts shutting it down, which makes sense. You have to, you can fight a bacterial infection, but you have to stop fighting it as soon as you clear the infection. So you have to turn those signals off. So these are checkpoints. Um, they're built into any kind of immune reaction, uh, um, especially to uh, uh, cellular immune immunity. It's very important to prevent chronic inflammation. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is sort of a chronic inflammatory state where there's not enough checkpoint control. Um, and uh, tumors use this uh, built-in mechanism to shut down, uh, shut down the immune response before it even gets going. So this is a, a detail of just a, a, a part of the interaction of a T cell 
up here. And down here, this, is the, this would be the tumor cell. And the main connection between a T cell and the tumor cell is this T cell receptor that binds to surface antigens on the tumor cell. And at the same time, there are interactions, this CTLA4 here, which is an inhibitory reaction with B7, or this PD1, PDL1 ligand interaction. This reaction is, is, this connection reduces the activity of this T cell receptor activi activation signal. So at the same time these two cells come together, the T cell is trying to kill, trying to become activated. It's the immune cell, the immune response is being downregulated um, by these molecular interactions. So a checkpoint inhibitor is just something that blocks that checkpoint. It blocks the interaction of PD-1 with PD-L1, for example. There are m multiple examples of checkpoint inhibitors. And these are typically antibodies. So pembrolizumab, the Keytruda molecule, which you see advertised um, on, uh, on commercials on TV, or novolumab, or other antibodies bind to either PD-1 or PD-L1, which is the ligand on the tumor that um, and, and this binding blocks these molecules from interacting, physically separates them. You don't have that inhibitory signal. It lets the T cell do its job, killing and, and activating other immune cells. So that's, that's sort of releasing a break. It's taking off this break and letting the, letting the immune response um, go. It's turned out to be very, very active in melanoma and other um, types of cancer. And, and there is some activity in neuroblastoma. So the other um, arm of immunotherapy, in 2019 anyway, is synthesizing new anti-cancer immunity. So we heard a little bit about chimeric antigen receptors, and these are actually chimers. So the, you're taking a patient's immune cells, the T cells, and, bind it and, and generating, with molecular biology, you're generating um, a mixed molecule this is a molecule, this is an antibody here, and you're taking the antibody binding site that recognizes a specific antigen. For instance, CD19 on the surface of a leukemia cell or GD2 on the surface of a neuroblastoma cell. You're taking that from an antibody and mix and actually physically making a gene that, that fuses, whoops, that fuses that with the multiple signaling uh, molecules that activate, uh, activate T cells. So, this is a chimer. This is a, a, something that doesn't exist in nature. It's a genetically engineered thing that takes advantage of the fact that we can clone these antibodies to very specific antigens, and they're, they're very, very specific target, um, target binding. So if we have a target that is of particular interest for a specific tumor, we can generate an antibody you, um, using a whole bunch of other technology that was developed in the 70s and 80s and 90s, um, we can clone that sequence, we can mix it with the sequence to activate these activating signals and then put it into a T cell. So it's, a, it's a, actually a tour de force of molecular biology and engineering to generate these CAR T cells which don't exist in nature. And so they, this is a way of redirecting the immune system to a specific antigen. These chimers are tumor, like as I mentioned, tumor specific they, and they activate many other immune cells um, because the signaling uh, signals that they put in into these uh, chimeric antigen receptors don't just activate the T cell to kill, but they also activate the T cell to secrete other molecules to bring other immune cells into the, the site of, uh, of activation. So it kills cancer cells directly, but they also kill cells indirectly by activating other molecules in the immune microenvironment. And these include um, altering uh, the activity of tumor-associated macrophages and altering uh, T, T regulate, regulatory T cells, but also amping up the activity of NK T cells, dendritic cells, monocytes, neutrophils. The whole armamentarium of immune cells can be activated by a chimeric antigen receptor targeting um, a specific tumor. So the best example and the example that, that uh, generated a huge amount of, of excitement in the oncology field was targeting CD19 on relapsed refractory leukemia. So 
the clinical trials that were done were in patients, leukemia patients, um, that all of their leukemia cells expressed CD19 on their surface. And these are all patients who had relapse, relapse refractory leukemia, which is another way of saying leukemia that was, they had six months to live or less, all of the children who were enrolled in these studies. And surprisingly, um, when, they, when they did this for uh, relapse refractory leukemia, or in, on the right-hand side for uh, lymphoma, for the leukemia trial, for example, 63 patients were evaluable. 52 of them went into complete remission with a single infusion of CAR T cells directed against CD19. So that's a remarkable, um, that's 80, 83% um, complete remission rate, which you need to go into complete remission before you can be cured from, uh, of leukemia or any cancer. And so that was very, very exciting. Um, Follow-up of these patients showed that about half of them, more than half of them, had durable remissions, i.e. look like they're going to be stay in remission for a long period of time. This is like three years or four years out now. So that's really, really exciting, right? Um, and the fact that this worked so well led to rapid approval by the FDA of CAR T cell therapy for relapse leukemia. As you might expect, the FDA fast-tracked this. They were very excited. They were convinced of the data. These trials have expanded now to all kinds of different types of uh, hematologic malignancies. Um, there are, it's not perfect, like any therapy. There is life-threatening um, toxicities from, from hyperimmune activation, so-called cytokine storm. And there's also neurologic toxicity, which appears to be reversible. Um, uh, Dr. Hexi mentioned a little bit some of the cost and complexity of generating CAR T cells to a specific tumor antigen. It's, it's not something that you can, right now anyway, just pull off the shelf and give to somebody. It takes a couple of weeks or, month or a month or, or more to generate this product to give to a patient. Um, resistance can develop very quickly if, they, if the tumor decides, oh, well, I don't need that antigen. I can downregulate it, and now your, your CAR T cells just miss me all, com all together, or, or other mechanisms of resistance develop. And then good targets need to be identified. The leukemia trials were really effective because every single um, leukemia cell expresses CD19. That's not necessarily true for GD2 or for other tumor antigens and neuroblastoma. So neuroblastoma is not leukemia. Um, uh, it's a solid tumor, and solid tumors have, first of all, right off the bat, they have a, a tumor microenvironment. They have multiple other cells that are there, immune cells, macrophages, um, they have, uh, there are fibroblasts that are there, there are stromal cells. It's a, it's a complex mixture of cells, it's not just tumor cells. And so all of those cells exclude T cells and act as a physical barrier to keep uh, therapies out, not just immunotherapies, but uh, uh, drug therapies as well. And also this environment is, is relatively hostile, it's hypoxic, it's acidic, it um, uh, has a lot of things that, that are, are prevent uh, immune reactivity, okay? So that's the tumor microenvironment, um, and as opposed to that in leukemia, when you think about it, CAR T cells mix directly with the um, with the cancer cells in the blood. Um, T cells and antibodies are designed to work in the blood. And leukemia is rapidly killed and cleared that way. In solid tumors, like I said, you have a, a, this, this nasty environment and there are a lot of other cells in the way. The other thing, and so this is sort of a picture of a tumor, this, think of the, the brown cells in the back are, uh, are the cancer cells. And all these other cells are different types of immune cells um, or, or immune, uh, uh, interacting uh, cytokines and, and that are going to prevent the, an, an immune reaction. So the cancer is very smart. Okay? It has learned, it's evolved actually, to downregulate the receptors on its surface that are going to activate T cells and upregulate receptors that are going to inhibit T cells. So cancers tend to upregulate PDL1 and, and so to encourage this negative interaction with T cells. And they also promote tumor-associated macrophages. They change them to be Im uh, immunosuppressive as opposed to immunoactivating. Um, 
And there are many, many examples and mechanisms of immunoevasion of cancer. So um, that's why solid tumors haven't progressed quite as, quite as quickly as, as the trials for leukemia. Um, so the major challenges, and this is just a partial list, uh, you have to overcome tumor immune suppression at the primary and metastatic sites. Um, and I, I should mention that the metastatic tumor microenvironment may be completely different than the primary microenvironment. Um, you have to predict and avoid resistance to your therapeutic approach. Um, and also determine the best way to incorporate new new modalities of therapy with chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation, which are the standard pillars of, of treatment. Um, and all of these lead to, and also, um, as, we, as you just heard about the NMIC oncogene, um, there are, our oncogenes do specific things to, to upregulate a immunosuppressive um, in microenvironment. And it's very hard to study all of these things without a tumor model where you can manipulate both the immune cells and the tumor cells to look at really con do controlled experiments. The really the only, the best experiment is in a patient, right, where they have an intact immune system and they have an intact cancer cells that are interacting with each other. It's, it's very difficult to do those kind of clinical trials like when you don't really know what you want to, want to focus on. Um, so there's a real need for, in the laboratory, immunocompetent models where we can control different, different uh, variables and, and look at how the tumor microenvironment and these interactions are, are preventing or, or stimulating uh, uh, killing of the cancer cells. Um, I wanted to introduce the, so one of the things that we're working on at, at UMass is, um, is just, that, just that approach to develop novel immunocompetent models for neuroblastoma so we can look at, at uh, uh, tumor growth in mice that have an, a human immune system. So the mouse avatar project is, is being, is, is a actually there's a core facility led by Dr. Dale Greiner and Michael Brem who are very um, uh, experienced and uh, um, experienced mouse modelers and immunologists. And they've been working, so they started out working on um, actually diabetes which is an immune uh, mediated um, a problem where, where the immune cells attack the, the pancreas. Um, and they've, they've developed a whole avatar mouse core for look at cancer modeling now. Um, and what they do is, so there's a team of immunologists, mouse geneticists, partnering with the JAX laboratory, which gives us a lot of power to develop models, uh, genetically modified mice very quickly. Um, and a system for generating immunodeficient mice that we can transplant with human immune cells. Um, as well as advanced flow cytometry and other approaches to, um, to analyze the human cells and the, this chimer, we're doing, making another kind of chimer here, we're making a mouse host that has a, is transplanted with a human immune system. And I have another slide, so I'm just gonna show you how we do make humanized mice, because it's really kind of, um, I think it's really cool. And it, it, it's gonna help us do a lot of neat experiments. So, First thing we do, we can isolate um, CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells. So these are the blood stem cells that are in your bone marrow that are making blood, um, making red cells, white cells, and platelets. And we can isolate those from cord blood. These are, these are usually, um, is a convenient source of human stem cells. Uh, the cord blood um, from, uh, from, from uh, cords of children who are uh, for, at birth, we can harvest um, umbilical cord blood stem cells. And these engraft very well in mice, it turns out. So you can harvest those, you have to purify them, of course. And then we can take genetically modified mice that are, have multiple different uh, modifications that make them immunodeficient. They don't make T cells, they don't make B cells, they, um, we've knocked out other um, receptors in them so that they don't make monocytes or dendritic cells. And then irradiate these mice to wipe out any other, any other immune cells they have, and then transplant them just like we would transplant a patient with these human hematopoietic stem cells. Next thing you do is you can implant them, so this is the transplant step, and then you wait, and wait about um, eight to 12 weeks, and you can, you can 
The mice are okay, believe it or not. You have to keep them clean and not expose them to um, pathogens because they're very immune deficient at this point. But once they develop an immune, a human immune system, they're, they have, um, you, can, you can measure uh, human immune cells. Um, their multiple different immune subsets are present. So you can have T cells, you can have B cells, you can have CD4 positive, CD8 positive T cells, all the, N, the NK, te, NK cells. Um, we haven't looked, but we believe they have um, the invariant chain NKT cells that Dr. Hexie talked about this morning. Mo human monocytes, human macrophages. Um, so, so really, they recapitulate the entire human immune system. And so that, you know, that having that available um, is a, is a, a tremendous resource because it's very. As you might imagine, it's very labor intensive to do this. You need a core of people, most most technicians and um, uh, immunologists to be able to evaluate, yes, these have been grafted, and no, they haven't been grafted. And we can do this. They can do this very routinely at, at UMass. And so what we've done, we took the opportunity to inject these mice with, with human neuroblastoma cell lines. Um, and just to see, can you engraft neuroblastoma in these humanized mice? And it turns out, yes, you can. And that was really exciting for us. So we, this is just some data from three different uh, neuroblastoma cell lines, SHSY5Y, which is a non-amplified uh, tumor that has an al activating ALK mutation. Uh, NGP is a MYC amplified cell line. LAN5 is MYC amplified with an ALK mutation. Um, and, and it turns out that, that this is a, looks like it's gonna be a really useful tool. It's genetically defined. We can take these cell lines, and if we want to upregulate a gene that we think is important, say we want to upregulate DFMO um, metabolism or, or um, ODC1, say, or if we want to, um, we can alter the level of MYC, we can look at AL. There's a lot of different flexibility here that we can take all of our experience in molecular genetics and molecular biology and modify these cell lines to look for specific immune reactivity genes. Um, at the same time, we can also modify the mouse. Um, and so we can delete receptors in the mouse, um, in the mouse and, we can, and we can alter the human immune cells that we're reconstituting the mice with. Um, so for all, of these, for all of these reasons, this turns out to be, it looks like a really good um, uh, model system to, to address some of the questions that you, you, know, you have been asking. Well, what type of immune therapy should we mix this with arinotecan, temozolomide? Should, you know, what's the best chemotherapy? Should we use radiation before immune therapy or after immune therapy? There's all these questions that we can test in these tumors growing in the context of a human immune system. This is just an example of human T cells uh, measuring, trying to see in, in uh, this is a uh, LAN5 tumor, which is a MYC amplified cell line. Um, taking this tumor out and looking, well, are there human immune cells infiltrating it and can we isolate those and can we characterize those? Sort of a preliminary pilot experiment, the first thing you'd want to do, right? And it turns out that there are. We can isolate this population of human cells in, within the tumor and we can even look at the CD4, uh, CD8 cells um, that, we, uh, we could, uh, that we found that we could purify. And here we measured the amount of PD, PDL1 expression on uh, sorry, um, PD-1 expression, not the PD-1 expression on the CD4 positive cells and CD8 positive cells. It turns out that we saw about 70% of the CD, whoops, sorry, of the 70% 70, 70 of the CD4 positive cells uh, expressed PD-1 in this experiment and 50% of the CD8 T cells, which are the killer T cells, expressed PD-1, this inhibitory, potentially inhibitory um, uh, ligand. If you look at the humanized blood of these mice, that was, there was much lower percentages of PD-1 expression. So the, the tumor is here is recruiting cells specifically that overexpress this inhibitory ligand. Or at least the microenvironment is enriched for T cells that had an inhibitory effect. And that's why this tumor was allowed to grow in these mice. At least that's our hypothesis. So you might, um, well, if you were me, you might think, well, let's see if we can use cell lines. What happens if we try to grow these tumors if we knock out PDL1 on the tumor so they can't interact with the T cells that way? And would they, would they grow better or worse? 
you'd predict that they wouldn't be able to engraft um, if you knocked out the, the PDL1 on the neuroblastoma cells. And that's an experiment you can do with this kind of model system. So this is uh, just a, a little bit of preliminary data that we, we just started these experiments taking using CRISPR-Cas technology. Here we use CRISPR-Cas12, which has some advantages for making mutations like that we knock out genes. Um, and the PDL1 gene, and just, this, this is just a description of the different coding sequences of the, of the PDL1 gene and showing that we did indeed knock out this gene in both alleles by uh, sequencing. And so if you, if you take that cell line, now this is, in a, this is the, the uh, Gemin cell line, which expresses surprisingly 90, more than 95% of the cell line is PDL1 positive. So it's a good test line to develop the technology with. Um, and this is the wild type uh, tumor, which, is, which shows a high expression of PDL1. And then after this CRISPR Cas knockout, we knocked it down to about 13%. Um, uh, a surface expression of PDL1. So you know that's just that's just this is sort of the cell line was used to to uh, validate this CRISPR-Cas technology. And we're going to do this for all the other neuroblastoma cell lines and, and see how they engraft. The other thing we're going to use this for is we can make cell lines that conditionally express PDL1. So instead of um, uh, or conditionally knock out PDL1. And so we could add a drug that will downregulate PDL1 and see what happens to tumor growth in vivo. So some of the studies that we're planning and that, that are ongoing with neuroblastoma and humanized mice are uh, looking at xenograft studies, implanting implanting tumors. We always implant in the within the. Sorry, let me back up. Um, we do orthotopic xenograft. We implant um, into the renal capsule um, and look at how MYC and ALK alter the the human immune microenvironment. Um, we're going to be evaluating metastatic disease and how the um, one thing we're particularly interested in, sorry, is looking at the impact of uh, cytokines such as GMCSF and GCSF and IL-2 and IL-21. There's a list of cytokines we're interested in looking at is how does that um, affect, these are human cytokines in human immune cells looking at human neuroblastoma, how does that affect their met metastasis to different sites? So previously, you know, in an in a immune deficient mouse model, we'd be injecting human immune cells but, and watching them, I mean, sorry, human tumor cells, we'd be watching these cells uh, migrate across the, around the mouse, but the metastasis is not really controlled by a human immune response. So we want to see how that looks in, in, this, in this system. And then we're also going to be looking at cancer stem cells. How that we're, um, we've obtained a strain that has um, where all the mouse cells do not express the GCSF receptor, so we can look at the role of GCSF on neuroblastoma cancer stem cells and the infiltrating tumor immune microenvironment. So we're very excited about these upcoming uh, this upcoming data that we may, maybe we'll present next year at the uh, at this meeting. Um, so back to Back to human immunotherapy for cancer. I wanted to emphasize, we were talking about a little bit at the break, that we use the word immunotherapy very um, generally, and it's, there's very, it has to be much more specific. So saying, like, my child got immunotherapy, it used to be if there was only one immunotherapy, i.e. 3F8 or an antibody against GD2, then okay, that's immunotherapy. But now there are many more things that are under the, rubric of immunotherapy, so I think we have to be much more careful what kind of language we use to describe immunotherapy. Because um, it can be very confusing, it's very confusing for doctors, it's even more confusing for, for parents, right? Now, what immunotherapy was it? Was it a cellular immunotherapy? Um, uh, sorry. So, you know, Andras talked about engineered CAR T cells down here. There are other kinds of CT cells. Um, there are other kinds of immunotherapy cellular-based immunotherapies, including NK cells and NKT cells and um, uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes. There's also cancer vaccines. Um, Dr. Kushner talked about the cancer vaccine that and he, he kind of, he, he didn't have a chance to go over all the details of it, but it's a very exciting cancer vaccine that um, stimulates an immune, immune response uh, in vivo to neuroblastoma. And then there's an, the checkpoint inhibitors, which are antibodies. So you, know, you can give someone cells, you can give them antibodies, you can give them vaccine. You can do all of this with accessory immune-stimulating molecules like cytokines and interleukins. So 
immunotherapy for cancer in 2019 is like this exploding field, right? It's like, it used to be one thing, now it's like many, many different things. So just kind of keep that in mind as you go forward and, and people talk to you about, uh, quote, immunotherapy for your, for your children. This is just a, 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 one of my last slides to show that the, the explosion of immunotherapy trials in pediatrics. Um, this is just a, a list that I put together, I don't know, about a year ago. Um, there are over, now there's well over 60 immunotherapy trials in pediatrics and, and over 40 that are open and, recru and recruiting patients. So you can see there's a lot of interest from the scientific community, but also from patients who want access to this technology. And, and it's really true now that um, immunotherapy is here to stay, um, whether it's gonna really definitively help us cure children with neuroblastoma and other solid tumors is um, up in the air. But I think, you know, even just as early as, as soon as like last year, we would consider surgery, radiation, and uh, chemotherapy as the three pillars for treatment for, for cancer in general. And now I think it's, it's pretty well accepted that immunotherapy is now a fourth pillar, and, and most cancers going forward are going to be treated with surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and some form of immunomodulatory therapy. Um, metastatic melanoma used to be a completely fatal disease, and now in many cases it's a curable disease with immunotherapy. So hopefully we can apply that to neuroblastoma going forward, and, and, um, and it's, it's, it's really exciting to be an oncologist these days because there's all these new therapies that are coming along and, and things to test and take, take back to the lab um, and try to move from the lab into the clinic, which is, which is the goal of most of us, are, uh, we translational researchers. Um, but it's also becoming very, very complex, and especially in a field like neuroblastoma where there's only 700 kids diagnosed a year in the United States, and how many patients, and there's way more trials than there are patients. So it's gonna take a lot of really careful preclinical evaluation of immunotherapy to really push it forward. Um, and that's really all I have to say. I'd love to t answer any of your questions. I I'd like to acknowledge all of you and, and all the children fighting, um, uh, fighting pediatric cancer. Um, these are the people in my lab, Ting Ting Yang, Esteban Rosen, and Kim Wigglesworth are all working really hard on this project while I'm traveling around talking about it. Um, and uh, this is a picture of our Lazar Research Building at the University of Massachusetts, which is a great place to work. Um, I also want to uh, acknowledge Hyundai Hope on Wheels, the CNCF Cancer Foundation, who's, who's funded some of my work, the NIH, who funds my R01 on this work, and also Scott Wolf and Michael Green, who are um, leaders at the Molecular Cell and Cancer Biology faculty at UMass. And um, with that, I'll uh, take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Okay, we have a question. Thank, thank you so much for putting so much together. It's, it's amazing, but you're right, it's such an upbeat, um, positive kind of right. development that things are going. Yeah. The question I have is, you know, anti-GD2 antibodies prove a therapy for neuroblastoma, but when it was first started to be used, it was used in patients with bulky disease, right. soft tissue disease, and it was clearly ineffective for, for bulky soft tissue disease. And a lot of what you and this morning the talk on CAR T cells was about the microenvironment and soft tissue disease and not doing well in that and having to deal with suppressor aspects of the microenvironment. Whereas with you know, anti-GD2 antibody, you know, it was quickly clear that marrow was the site where it's gonna work. You don't have to worry about all those things. And even though it was not effective against soft tissue disease, it was amazingly effective against neuroblastoma sitting in the bone marrow. And I'm worried that people are, you know, are gonna miss the boat on the CAR T cells and CAR T, uh, NK T cells, et cetera, by dealing with patients who have soft tissue disease, which maybe, maybe sophisticated measures are gonna be undertaken to improve possibility of response there, but check out patients who just have marrow, obvious bone marrow disease, MIBG positive plus, evidence of it on, on biopsies and see what th those treatments are work, uh, how they do in th that setting, which is more likely to have an effect. And, and the Absolutely. other ongoing efforts to improve 
efficacy against residual soft tissue disease or persistent soft tissue disease can continue. But you know, I'm really looking forward to you, you know having better treatments all the time. And maybe there's one sitting here, but it's not getting to the point of widespread use because it's it's not being looked at in a way that gives it the best chance to show how it's effective. That that's it. Uh, those are great observations, and, and, and the, I think one of the things that I, I didn't actually detail it on one of my slides, but one of the things about the model that we're building is our cells are, are fluorescently tagged, so we can look at the fluorescent signature in the bone marrow and in other, um, other parts of the body, and it is true that, you know, that's a really, one thing we want to test is can we clear bone marrow disease from these mice, and, and, and are there ways, and, and, and demonstrate um, immunoreactive reactive, uh, cell killing um, in, in other places like the bone marrow. And, and the other part of your, um, your question was about the uh, uh, bulky, bulky disease and, and when is the best time to use, to, to use a, a, an, a synthetic uh, uh, immune retargeting approach and, and, and what are the best ways to traffic cells into tumors, et cetera. It's gonna, it, it, we will see, we'll see what happens. Uh, I think, you know, the reason why we're not saying use immunotherapy by itself is that you really need to do cytoreduction and get, and uh, all of these therapies are gonna work best when you have minimal residual disease. Um, so if you can't control, uh, uh, and unfortunately if you can't control uh, cancer with, with chemotherapy to at least reduce the tumor burden, it's gonna be hard to cure it no matter what, how good your, your results are. So. Yeah, but I'm just saying in the, in the phase one trials with these CAR T cells, right. neuroblastoma, they should be looking at patients who have marrow disease. And, you know, marrow really, disease really, only, yeah. yeah. You know, so that can really evaluate, um, you, know, with the, get, you know, have a target that can really expect it to see efficacy. If, it, if, it's, if it's promising, it's gonna show it there. Absolutely, I totally, I totally agree with that. We have any other questions? No. One more? Okay. When you talk about the resistance, is that like the Hakka and Hama and those? No. That's different? The, so those are, those are uh, like um, uh, react, reactions to, to mouse versions of antibodies. No, I'm talking about resistance in terms of the tumor being able, so for instance, the PDL1 antibody. Um, the tumors will end up um, massively upregulating PDL1 on their surface on their surface to try to make that antibody less effective, or delete it altogether and get by without PDL1 and see what happens. Um, if you're targeting a specific antigen, for instance, say say where the